there. Um, excited to see a pretty good turnout. Uh, whether or not you just stumbled in, you saw Chick-fil-A or what, but uh, this is the Free Speech Alliance's first installment in our Free Speech Speaker Series of the Year. Uh, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to David Sainz for Freedom of Thought and Discourse for sponsoring this event, bringing in the food, and uh, helping coordinate a little bit. Uh, specifically, we want to thank Savannah Damon, Kevin Cook, and John Craig uh, for their help uh, throughout this whole organizational process. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Free Speech Alliance, FSA exists to ensure a learning environment at Davidson that is ideologically balanced and that promotes lively and fearless freedom of debate and deliberation here on campus. As part of that mission, we're honored to welcome Dr. John Rose to our campus. Dr. Rose serves as Associate Director of the Civil Discourse Project, and he's an instructor at Duke University's Keenan Institute for Ethics. We're eager to hear from Dr. Rose, but we kindly ask that you please hold any questions or comments for Dr. Rose until the end of his presentation. Uh, with that, we'd like to welcome Dr. Rose. Dr. Rose. Disclaimers in order. Uh, I don't know everything, far from it. Um, what I'm going to say in the next 30 or so minutes uh, is my best estimation of where things stand with respect to free speech on campus and what can be done about it. But my experience is limited. I've only taught at one school. Not all schools are the same. And I haven't met every last student. And this is extremely complicated matter. About my background, I teach a class called How to Think in an Age of Political Polarization at Duke. It's really a course on civil discourse, how to have hard conversations. And I've been doing this for about five years. At this point, I've taught about 400 students. And I coffee with almost every one of them outside of class. So I have some sense of where the students are coming from. Where is that? Well, I suspect Davis, Davidson students are a bit like Duke students in this respect. Um, a lot of my students don't feel comfortable talking about hot button political topics. The word or phrase that comes up here a lot is self-censor. There have been a lot of surveys done, maybe you've had them done at Davidson, on this phenomenon. And revealing some somewhat worrying trends. Students increasingly feel uncomfortable expressing their views. Now there's been a lot of disagreement about how to interpret these surveys. Um, some people say, well, you all, since I see some of these students in the army, uh, aren't speaking your minds because you're just merely being polite. Others say, perhaps it's because you really do have some very unacceptable views you shouldn't be uttering. Um, some, some people say it's out of pre-professionalism. And this is something I've certainly discovered at Duke. Um, a very competitive meritocracy. Students work hard to gain admission to elite universities. And they don't want to screw it up. It's perfectly logical. I once had a young woman in my class who, second day of class, uh, raised her hand and said, you know, Dr. Rose, uh, work incredibly hard to get here. Um, why should I risk my future job at McKinsey uh, by telling you what I think about transgender athletes or something like this? Just, it's perfectly logical. Um, and it's, it's too bad she felt that way. But it made sense. Um, having led open discussions with all these students uh, over the last five years, I, I can with some confidence say that the reason students self-censored isn't because they have just morally abhorrent views. Um, I've never had students share such views. Um, I think admissions are a better job than that. Um, and it isn't just a matter of courtesy. It's because 
in addition to pre-professionalism, uh, they, you all perhaps, at the end you can tell me if this description is accurate, uh, don't completely trust your fellow classmates, or maybe in some cases your teachers, uh, who will give you grades, uh, with what you say. You're worried it's going to be misinterpreted or not heard charitably. Uh, maybe you have the wrong view, or maybe you have the right view, but you're just worried it will, won't come out right or be heard the way you intend it to be heard. So the deficit is one of trust. Trust, this is a very important word. I think to build the right sort of academic communities and a culture of free speech on campus, trust is required. But trust is something that is built and earned over time. More on that uh, in a little bit. Um, so first, like a little bit of a diagnosis about what's going on on college campuses. This, this is my reading. It is increasingly the, the fault lines uh, aren't actually progressive versus conservative. Uh, right wing versus left wing. I think they are instead liberal and illiberal, or at least um, they're moving in this direction. Um, so to be successful, um, student clubs um, like yours or free speech organizations uh, like our sponsor here today um, need to be, in, in my view, nonpartisan coalitions of kind of classical liberals from the left and right, right? The old sense of the word liberal. Meaning you're committed to certain rights and procedures um, that uh, apply to all people, right? Uh, regardless of your particular uh, political sympathies. Uh, this alliance is, is a little unnatural and, and uneasy for, for both sides at times, uh, because um, in this case today, it's, it's going to make for a kind of a coalition of some unlikely bedfellows. Um, <laughs> those of you in the Alumni Association, uh, you know, you're going to get, and, and I know this because I helped start one at Duke, a similar club, uh, you're going to have everything from kind of conservative Christians to uh, kind of enlightenment rationalist atheists, right, who just don't like the fact that you can't have, you can't argue anymore. Uh, you're going to have Steven Pinker and Robert George on the same side. Um, so that's okay. And in your student clubs, it's going to be similar, okay? Uh, you need to make it a big tent. Uh, it need, these student groups, I think, need to be places where students with any views are welcome, provided they want real conversation. And that's the common denominator. Um, so to be successful, these clubs and coalitions uh, need to be honest in their appraisals of the situation. I mean, you should be able to call a spade a spade. If we have a problem with free speech, you should say it. If we have a problem with orthodox, you should say it. Um, while at the same time, if you can do both at once, uh, being positive and constructive in, in the way you go about your business. You need to model the kind of dialogue you want more of in the university. Yeah, you need to avoid, assuming this is a temptation at all, a kind of burn it all down attitude, um, but rather uh, embrace a kind of collective call to improve the institutions you, you care about, show that you care about them, be hospitable, and all that you do. Don't be caustic, don't, don't be provocateurs. Your student group, don't invite provocateurs to campus just for the sake of irritating. Uh, show a better way, and in doing so, you'll draw more people to your work and prove to your administration and your teachers and your fellow students your real intentions, which I know are good ones. If you care about something, you will say when it needs improving. Just ask my wife. That was a joke. <laughs> Please laugh. <laughs> <laughs> students, um, practice the intellectual virtues in your conversations with other students. Uh, this will win you uh, some converts to free and open inquiry. Be humble, be curious, be courageous, be charitable. What do these words mean? Some of you maybe have taken a class on Aristotle. Well, being humble means speaking and listening in a way which you demonstrate that you don't assume you know everything. Admit your own fallibility, we're all fallible. That changes conversation. Being curious means wanting to know why somebody thinks differently. This is very different than your own view, even if the view you don't like or you naturally kind of recoil from. Find yourself using the phrase, spoken in a kind voice. How did you come to think that? Tell me your story. I'm genuinely curious. 
and allow others to be curious. If you've ever been in a tense conversation, you know how much it can help for somebody to, especially if you don't expect it, ask a very innocent, probing question that really makes clear that they're just trying to get closer to the truth. That'll ease the air. You go, okay, all right. This is not about winning or causing the other side to lose face. Or owning the other side, it's about trying to get closer to maybe a better notion of justice or just simply understanding each other. Um, being um, curious means also uh, letting other people think in real time. Sometimes you kind of don't know where a question is going uh, in class and conversation with other students. Don't jump on that. Don't pile on. You're like, I don't know. It's just like, just, I don't know where this is going, but here's what I think. It's okay. Give them the space to do that. Being courageous means just what it sounds like. <laughs> Having the courage to, to stick up for your views. Um, one thing I've noticed about courage in the classroom is that it's contagious. I think all virtues and vices are contagious, by the way. Um, so I've, I've seen students kind of say, well, you know, I, I think this. I was afraid to say it, but I think this. And then, lo and behold, another student will, will raise his or her hand and, and then offer, you know, something else that's courageous. That's how it works. But the virtue I think is most important is charity. So um, speaking, listening, conversing charitably um, means many things, but uh, a few dimensions I want to mention are, are this. Um, it means listening to each other's remarks uh, to understand, not to immediately formulate, I'm going to tell you five reasons why you're wrong and embarrass you once you're done talking, assuming I don't cut you off. Um, it also means hearing each other's remarks in what seems to you to be kind of the most reasonable possible interpretation, right? Put the best spin on it, not the worst spin. It means talking in a way where it makes clear that you're trying to work together, work towards possible friendship with the other person. You actually want them on your side. You're not trying to cast them out. Um, one version of, of um, charity that I like is, is willing the good of the other. Willing the good of the other, right? Um, so you don't actually want to see this person uh, humiliated and unfriended and so on and so forth. Rather, um, you want what's good for them. Right? Ch charity, charity in all things. Um, if you do these things, other students will want to be in conversation with you. They want to join your club. <laughs> um, I think deep down we all hunger for the truth and are, and are naturally drawn to environments where we think we might be able to get closer to it. Um, show yourself humble by acknowledging your limitations, as I said. Um, let other people tell your stories. Uh, doing all these things, acting charitably, um, gives you the possibility of not only converting people um, generally to the cause of free speech, but also possibly to your own political views. It also means uh, opening yourself up to moving closer to their views, <laughs> right? Uh, you, can't, you can't expect one and, and not do the other. Uh, that's only fair. Um, it, may, it may feel good to vent. I, I know we all do that sometimes, but it doesn't help. Um, about the virtues, I sometimes tell my students, you're getting the hang of my class if you can recognize the virtues, intellectual virtues, in other people with whom uh, you don't share a political, uh, a political party. Or So you can say, I, I, I disagree with what you said, but I recognize that actually took courage to say in this environment. And I admire that. Like, that's good. Um, now, even if you do all this, if you act virtually, virtuously, excuse me, um, you're, you're still going to have detractors in our modern academy. Uh, I get it. Um, this goes for student groups or alumni groups promoting free speech and viewpoint diversity. Um, just continue to do good, do good work. Um, you know, some criticisms, you know, some, some will say that the language for free speech or viewpoint diversity today is, is code uh, for permitting harmful language or ideas, which typically means conservative. 
on campus is in the classroom. Um, many things to say in response to this, why I think this is, this is unfair and wrong. The first to note is that these critiques forget their history. <laughs> Free speech was a rally cry from Americans on the political left not so long ago. And that makes sense. Uh, it, it is natural that those with, with minority views in a particular place and time will, will find protection in these ranks and will invoke, invoke them. It's part of the genius of our Constitution. Um, second, I, I would say in response is make clear that by making space for different sides of issues uh, that are dividing people in America, um, that you are actually um, not so much legitimizing this view or that view, but you're putting deliberate democracy into practice. You're legitimizing democracy. Declaring issues settled because some of us feel strongly about them in the university, never mind that many Americans of goodwill and sound mind might feel differently, isn't just bad pedagogy in the classroom, it is that. And it, it isn't just uh, uh, an instance of removing the opportunity for students to grow, uh, it's also a failure of democracy at a time when we desperately, desperately need our institutions of influence to rise above partisanship. Universities don't just have a mandate to facilitate these hard conversations. Uh, in my view, they have a moral responsibility. Particularly so when we see declining trust in our institutions, uh, especially uh, universities. There's a, a recent I think it was a poll, poll survey on this that showed a uh, high percentage of increasing, the high percentage of Americans say um, universities don't have a positive influence on America, something like this. It's alarming. Um, uh, next, um, what? I think it's, it's telling, uh, so I think it's telling, it gives me hope, that universities are trying to do better when it comes to free speech. They're, they're making efforts to improve civil discourse. I mean, witness the creation of your deliberative democracy club, right? This alumni association, the fact that I'm here. All grounds for hope. Uh, you know, why does this matter? I, I think it, because it shows that universities do regard you know, groupthink or censorship as a problem. They're embarrassed when incidents like what happened at Stanford Law School, there's a, a speaker who was shouted down, a conservative judge, occur. Uh, students, uh, schools don't want to be seen as a liberal because they know they're not supposed to be. <laughs> you think this is a small thing, this is important, right? Uh, you can imagine a situation in which universities say, yeah, so what? Like, let's just have the equivalent of like a, uh, a faith statement that all of the hires need to sign that shows that they're sufficiently this uh, this be political view, right? Let's say a progressive view in the case of elite institutions. They don't do that, right? And they'd be embarrassed to do it. This is important. Um, they would know that they'd be failing in their mission if they did this. Um, thus, the need to demonstrate, for instance, how their commitments to inclusion are compatible with free speech. Um, if we had abandoned a liberal inquiry, if they had, there'd be no need to even try us. So organizations like your alumni group uh, can help uh, universities by helping them remain true to their mission, it seems to me. So how, how given all, all this will the, will the story unfold, uh, what's in store for higher education? Uh, again, like disclaimers, I, I, none of us really know for sure. Um, people like to talk about a pendulum swinging back in the direction of a culture of free speech as more and more students, alums, and faculty feel like the, the window of, of acceptable possible views is getting squeezed a little bit too tight or moving too far in one direction. As someone who teaches an undergraduate course on civil discourse, I can say that more and more students want a classroom environment with greater tolerance for, for viewpoint diversity. So maybe the pendulum swinging. On the other hand, there remain a couple of realities that make me, make me a little bit skeptical of, of campuses really becoming, kind of, once again, kind of bastions of free speech. Um, so the first is that the, the ideological makeup of our faculty, and, and here I really mean the humanities, is, is already pretty politically skewed, it's, it's indisputable, there's a lot of data on this. And I think we'll become even more so in, in the years to come with no signs of, of reverse, and this is how hiring works, as we know how tenure process works. Hire 
faculty hire faculty. Um, I mentioned, uh, for instance, in, in when I was talking about the kind of coalition, that it's going to need to be people on the, the left and the right, and, um, and the, the, the people on the left who are kind of committed classical liberals are really important in this because uh, they have some power in the universities. It's Arizona they power. Um, so these, are, they, these people are a key component in, in the coalition. Unfortunately, <laughs> to be down uh, in my experience, um, these kind of committed classical liberals on the left tend to be a little bit older. Um, demographics matter here. Um, so kind of the increase in ideological homogeneity of the faculty is, is going to prove challenging um, as, as time goes on, as these people retire. So I, I think it, you know, be at some elite schools, maybe in another 15 years, uh, it's not inconceivable that we could have, you know, humanities divisions, almost entirely humanities divisions, without, without any conservatives. I think this is very possible. Um, the second reason I, I'm a little skeptical that the, the pendulum is going to swing back is, is that because we as a country are, are just so damn polarized uh, that both sides now feel warranted, justified, uh, in behaving deliberately, right? taking away other people's rights to speech, for instance. Okay, that's what I mean. Uh, on the grounds that, um, hey, we're stopping the other side, who, by the way, is even more liberal, more dangerous. <laughs> Uh, we're stopping them from having its way and from having power. So it's obvious, like this cycle only reinforces itself. Right? It's, it's a vicious cycle, and and we need we need to break this. Uh, you need to create a counterculture in, in student clubs and these alumni groups. A counterculture that, that stops this. Um, so what's this cycle look like? Well, on elite college campuses, um, it means that uh, concerns about free speech being censored from the left doesn't look so bad uh, when you look at the threat of, of, say, Trump and the takeover of right-wing populism, right? So democracy itself is at risk. What's such a big deal about canceling a few turfs, right? Um, of course, and, and here's where the cyclical nature of the problem comes in, Americans on the right uh, point to the illiberal behavior by the left on campuses and in the media as justification for their populism, right? And some of their liberal tendencies. So Trump's successes are excusable because, you know, this according to this logic, the left has a, a cultural monopoly and, and has already taken democracy away, right? Um, we're being ruled by an undemocratic liberal elite, they say, right? So it goes with no end in sight. Sorry, this is such a downer. Um, but I'm just trying to be honest with kind of what we're up against here. Because you, you, you can't see the university as an institution uh, in isolation and see it within the country, a polarized country. So amid all of this, um, organizations like your, your student club and this alumni group must remain true to the cause of free speech, must remain consistent, regardless of whether it makes the, the left or, or the right look bad in a particular circumstance. That's one way you build trust by being consistent and showing that you're willing to call out your own side. Um, just as when you have a chance to embarrass the other person, you don't do it, that builds trust. When you're willing to call out your own side, it, it shows that you, you're sticking to your moral principles. So we, you need to be above partisanship. I think it's getting harder and harder in this country to do that and to forge alliances across party lines. Okay, so where, did, where does this leave us? Um, as I said earlier, I don't, I don't have all the answers. Um, but my humble advice <laughs> is, to, is to keep doing the work you're already starting here. Um, sounds, sounds great from what I, what I heard. Um, talking to Professor Bullock. Um, keep trying to influence people at the most local level um, by doing you know, better teaching in the classroom by being more open in personal conversation. Your little interactions with other people, political things come up, your behavior in this conversation has, has a ripple effect. You know, when you think about culture, it's really just an aggregate of all of those things. And, that, and that, that you may say, oh, I, I want like a, a quick solution. Like We just need to change the rules and have a kind of a top-down answer. Eh, like, you know, I, people talk a lot about 
uh, getting the Chicago principles. Okay, I'm offending the Chicago principles. Students, you don't know what that is. It's just trying to get, getting your campus to like officially commit to free speech and so on and so forth. And, right? This is a good thing, right? But you can have all of that and still have students who are unwilling to talk, who are failing in the intellectual virtues, and so the, the, the good conversation isn't happening. Those, those are just rules. Um, to create a real culture of free speech, it, ch it requires a change in habits and change in behavior. Right? I think it requires virtue. <clears throat> Be a friend to those who have been socially ostracized for their views. Um, um, if, if faculty or students feel like there are high social penalties for sharing their views, they'll, they'll naturally keep quiet. Even if they're technically protected from official punishment, people don't want to lose friends. Some human beings are. We're very tribal. Uh, these are these instincts that kick in um, where you're afraid to be in the, in the out group. Um, I mean, they've studied this. Uh, it's, it's act, the portion of your brain, I forget that it says activated. So it's, 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 it's primitive. It's, it's there from the time of evolution in which being cast out of the tribe literally meant you were dead. <laughs> you were dead, right? But in, in today, and especially in, your, in the adolescent brains, where this is this part still developing, um, this 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 part of the brain is activated when you think I'm going to be socially outcast, right? Um, I'm going to be canceled on social media. My friends are going to declare me this or that uh, thing, and and uh, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Um, we also now have evidence about the toll this is taking on the. Psychological health of young people, uh, this cancel culture. Um, so, uh, build your communities um, on a commitment to to diversity that is not politically indexed. Only this or that form of diversity, but not um, uh, political diversity. Build a community on a, on a commitment to free speech for all. Don't declare winners and losers, right? Um, make it a community dedicated to a notion of belonging that is not politically indexed. There's not a political litmus for being part of this community. I mentioned the Stanford Law incident involving Judge uh, Kyle Duncan, who got shouted off the stage. And people analyzed this thing to death. Um, they talk a lot about the relationship between free speech and, and DEI, but I, I think maybe a better way to think about what happened there is that um, before he ever arrived, before he ever took the stage, um, some people decided, an unelected group of people I might add, that he did not belong. Uh, belonging, in this case, is somewhat upstream of, of uh, free speech uh, because of his views, right? So, so try to build countercultural communities at your school at Davidson uh, in which all belong uh, because they're committed to open inquiry. You don't belong because you're conservative or you're liberal or you're this or that or libertarian. That's, that's, that's not the, the litmus test. Um, um, and committed to a collective pursuit of truth. Um, this means you're going to hear some views you don't like, but Here's, here's the greater uh, prize. Um, you'll be getting closer to the truth, to the nature of justice. You're going to enjoy the excitement of a conversation in which you, you don't know where you're going to land. You don't know where the conversation's going. You're also going to be happier. <laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? That was going to be a happiness. Um, so young people today are self-censoring uh, because they want to be liked, right? Or they don't want to be disliked. The, the fancy academic phrase for this is uh, social uh, desirability bias. Okay, I think I got that right. right? Um, now, you might think, that makes sense, if, if young people today are, are behaving in ways, when it comes to expressive views, that will, in their mind, minimize the chance that they'll be disliked, maximize the chance to be liked, then you almost have a lot of friends, right? Turns out you don't. Um, according to research, this is just anecdotally too, I've, I've seen this. Um, your generation 
is reporting really high levels of loneliness and anxiety, and really low numbers can be true. It only makes sense that both are happening because deep, genuine friendship kind of makes us happy, the kind that everybody needs, the kind that if you don't have, no matter what other things you have in life, you won't be happy, according to Aristotle. He was right. Uh, that kind of friendship, the real thing, uh, requires honesty and trust with the other person. So those Facebook friendships in which you're just kind of signaling, you know, I think this or that so that you'll remain liked, and that's, a, that's not a real friendship. Some of it in, in person as well. What you really want is somebody with whom you can s say what you think, and even if they disagree with you, they remain your friend. That's a true friend. That's the kind of friendship that makes us not lonely. That's the kind of friendship in which you continue to will the good of the other even when you have sharp disagreements. So we need to build communities among alums, among students, and in particular in the classroom in which this trust exists and with it the possibility of friendship across political difference and the living out of a real culture of free speech that your student organization and your alumni associate organization worthily, very worthily, seek to promote and protect. Thank you. I like a lot of time for Q&A because I go to a lot of talks and almost always the Q&A is better than the talk. I mean, I'm going to the wrong talks. <laughs> So, um, yeah, any, any questions? I, I, at various points, described students, and, and maybe I did not describe David's students. I don't know. Um, but you're welcome to ask questions about anything. About my class, about free speech, um, about Duke. Uh, yeah. I feel like I'm in class, and I just got nobody raising his hand in my cold call. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, and if, if you could introduce yourself, maybe you're yes. here, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Shaheen Omadi. I'm a senior uh, okay. in the DCI. Um, okay, wonderful. Yes. Um, I okay. I, I I haven't formulated my question well, but I think um, on your notes on friendship, and that you can disagree with people and you can still be friends. Yeah. Uh, I I try to relate that in my own life. I'm an immigrant, uh, and um, I, I'm not a citizen. And how can I be friends with people who are opposed immigration in the US? Mm -hmm. Meaning that their disagreement is fundamentally in clash with some aspect of my identity. Now, I mean, that, that can be generalized to many other cases, whether that identity is, I don't know, um, sexual identity or yeah. things like that. Yeah. So. I might say something unpopular. Um, but I think that we have to find ways of creating and sustaining friendship that don't require us to always affirm all of each other's identities. I know that's like a really unpopular thing to say. Uh, but I just think it's necessary for democracy to continue. I mean, the alternative is that if you don't affirm this aspect of identity, um, we, we as citizens, we can't come together, right? We can't, we're, we're gonna have increased polarization. Uh, and, I, and I get that that's, that's hard for people. Um, but just know that in a, in a highly pluralist society, we are that exceptionally so in America. And one of the reasons this is so hard is what we're trying to do in America, right? You look around the other place in the world, it's not, they're not as multi not as, right? Um, that all the groups today in America feel like there are aspects of their identity that are, are being offended or not affirmed or made fun of. Um, and we have to find a way to tolerate that while trying to work together. So tolerance, I, I think, so there's, very, there's a lot of interesting work being done on tolerance right now. I think tolerance is a virtue. Uh, but it's not a virtue if it just means like indifference. I think it's something more like the patient 
forbearance of a perceived wrong or a, just a disagreement for the sake of keeping alive democratic life together, possible friendship together. And in this case, that's what it means. I know that's like a hard thing to say, but I, I just, because there are people who, of goodwill and sound mind, feel differently about immigration, you know? And what are you gonna do? You know, we gotta, we gotta make better arguments. You gotta, you gotta come to them, you gotta tell them your story, right? And if you're gonna get them to hear your story and maybe persuade them, um, you gotta be willing to sit down with them, right? Um, you gotta be open to, to this kind of, I think, friendship. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you, that was a great question. Yeah. I see more hands, this is great. It's just like a class. One, 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 one student asks a question and now more. All right, please, yeah. Hi, I'm Flo, uh, also from the DCI, and I'm from Germany. Um, yeah. I would be interested in your opinion on the role of media in creating polarization of echo chambers. Yeah, uh, so lots been said about this. Uh, Ezra Klein's book, Why We're Polarized, is very good on this point. I signed it in my class. So the short answer is, is media is making us more polarized. No doubt about it. Uh, the way modern media works, uh, we get it according to our tastes, we get in our own algorithm, and the news uh, affirms us that our side's right, and it outrages us about the behavior of the other side. And we like that. We get dopamine hits. And it keeps us in echo chambers. Social media is really bad about this. Um, and it's unfortunate. So there's, it's really interesting to say, well, so what's to be done about it? Um, there's actually a a friend of mine who teaches at Duke uh, runs something called the Polarization Lab, and he looked at uh, social media and and figured out uh, did, ran an experiment in which he had people follow uh, bots as a word or whatever algorithms that took them to news of the, the other whatever their other side is you know if they were liberal you conservative vice versa uh, and then tracked whether or not this made them more or less polarized. What, is he, what do you think he found? You, so the idea is like, oh, we'll make them less polarized because they got to hear the other side, right? But it didn't uh, um, because they just got more adamant. Like they got pissed off. You know, if you're, if you're conservative, you listen to MSNBC, you just get pissed off. Um, now I will say um, this was on the internet, and these were bots. Um, I think you know, like your club and, and my class. Um, it's. I think students can really benefit from hearing students with other people, but it's got to be flesh and blood. It's got to be another person, and you got to build a little trust. And you got to hear their stories, where they're coming from. I think that's key. So one thing that's bad about media is that it is disembodied. It's not you're hearing, but you need to you need to actually meet with people. So media is making things worse, definitely. Sorry to pile on media, but it's, it's making it worse. It is. I mean, it, it can it can do better. Look, there are great instances of like. Long form journalism, I can point you to that's really good, you know, and everybody should read that. But people don't want that. That's the problem, it's human nature. We don't want that. We want the other thing I described. So we just we're bad for ourselves. So. Another hand, please. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm Edward, I'm also called the DCI. I'm a junior from North Carolina. I wanted to ask you, because we were talking a little bit about conservatism. So you, so the direction of conservatism and right wing populism, do you think this is just recently been an, an anomaly by by a leader, or did it, or do you think that conservatism always, in a sense, kind of had this direction that it needed to go, but they didn't find that person until like former President Trump came to power? Oh boy, that's quite a question. I have taught a class on conservatism at Duke, and I, I start with Edmund Burke, and I go way back, and there's this big sweep, and then I get up to the president, and I kind of stop right there. Uh, and but this is interesting. So I have a conversation with my students. Um, okay, everything you've just heard, you know, or all, all the other conservative thinkers and all of their thoughts about tradition and values and whatever. Um, do you think it's just your question? Do you think the modern Republican Party is the natural outcome of that? Is the intellectual heir, rightfully descendant, of what I just told you? And I get students on the left, who are political left, say yes and say no. And I get students on the political right, some say yes, and some say no. <laughs> what do you agree? But so, I mean, I'm sort of ducking your question. I think I, there, there are arguments that have been made in all directions by all different kinds of people. Um, clearly, like, it, it's something that needs to be looked at. Like, it's a question that conservatives weren't asking themselves, I wasn't alive, but probably during the Reagan era, like, is this really? Not, 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 that wasn't not a fierce, it is now. 
because it does feel like something has changed with this populism. Um, but again, is it, is it consistent with what came before, or is it a rupture? Um, I, I, I can't answer. Good question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the word virtue rather frequently. Yeah. Uh, and there's a common relationship between virtue and spirituality. Yeah. You also said that uh, the high levels of anxiety and loneliness. Yeah. And is there any attachment between high levels of loneliness, anxiety, and the lack of church attendance in our current culture? So I think there's definitely a connection between uh, declining levels of religiosity. I don't like that word, but you know what I mean. People who are religious, uh, declining levels, especially young people, and increased levels of kind of strong identitarian-based activism. Because I think it functions, and I don't say this, like, you know, just for those of you who say that's me, it's just observations. I think it, func it functions and serves kind of the, the same role as traditional religion, uh, um, in that it creates a strong sense of kind of uh, purpose and meaning in life. Um, there's in-group and out-group. Um, there are heretics. <laughs> so, sometimes it's a bad form of religion. Um, but, and so it would make sense in a younger generation where these things that traditionally defined people, um, um, church, family, local community, no longer do that they would, in the wake of that, be, be looking, be feeling anxious, feeling, um, um, yeah, uh, lonely in some ways. Because we, we get, you know, historically, those things told you who they were and gave you community and gave you security, right? Um, and then look elsewhere for it. And, and one place to find it is, is, um, is in politics. Um, and I think, um, so it's interesting, because I'll ask my students, like, uh, give me your, top four markers of identity, you know? And, and um, I didn't do the survey 40 years ago, but I suspect you'd get answers something like, I'm, I'm a Christian or a Muslim or I'm Jewish or I'm from Ohio or I'm a Rose, um, um, I'm an American, right? Those answers aren't near as high among people in elite institutions like Davidson and, 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 and Duke. Instead, you get um, answers like, um, I'm a liberal, <laughs> uh, or I'm LGBTQ, T, um, or um, yeah, these these are these are different answers than you historically get, right? So I think these identities have kind of stepped in. What is, uh, what is that transition? Well, I mean, I could give you a long story about secularism, how that came to be, um, um, but it's a complicated one. Um, so, but I, that that is. So there's the secularism, but then there's the why, why did kind of family break down? Um, that's another story. Um, why did place seem to matter? Why does it seem to matter less? And that has to do with the mobility of people who um, are successful in meritocracy. You all move around for your jobs, right? If you get a job, good job in Chicago, you move there, right? That didn't used to be the case, right? So the, the, the things that traditionally kind of anchor people, place, family, religion, and country, don't anymore. And some people think that's for the better. Um, but it would make sense that then people look for, because human beings need identity, right? Um, and so that there would be a correlation there with an uptick in kind of finding a real strong sense of identity and purpose in some of these other groups, right? Um, I, think, I think it's logical. And some people think it's for the better. Yeah. yeah. So uh, with presidential elections coming up, how, what would you uh, recommend a college, college campus do to properly prepare or I don't know, like throw parties beforehand and just discussions and debates, or what would be the ideal like uh, election preparation in your mind for Duke or Davidson? So everybody gets excited about uh, like deliberative democracy around like election year. Some kid, I, I, some, I, I think it's like the worst time to do, or the hardest time to do it, right? Like you need to do it in the lull when people are like a little less worked up about things, like, hey, can we have a conversation? Although it's all the more important to be doing it at this time. Um, so um, I, just, I just think um, creating an environment 
that is that is loose, that is relaxed, that is welcoming, right? I remember what I said about belonging. Everybody belongs here. If you want to have a conversation, um, and you kind of say like, we're we're not here to like cancel each other. We're not doing that. Um, create that environment and then just see what happens. Let it, let it be, let let it happen naturally. Like I said, I think people are drawn to truth, and I think people don't like that we so disagree. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting, like we want to convince each other. Right? I think this is kind of deep in human nature. We don't like that we disagree. I have my own, I mean, coming to religion, I, my training is actually in theology, not political science. And like, I have my own theory about this. That I, I think disagreement is actually unnatural to people in the way that death is unnatural. Um, that's the most natural thing in the world, we all die, right? I mean that in a teleological sense. I don't think it was ever meant to be. <laughs> I think it's an artifact of the fall. That's why we hate it, uh, and it feels like wrong. Like we want to convince each other. So what we really long for, even though we're, you were canceling each other, we're saying I hate you, want a national order, what we really want deep down is to actually be in agreement with each other. And it pisses us off that we can't do it, right? So then you get this kind of behavior. But deep down, I think that's what we want. Let's do it more, yeah. Okay, let's go. Uh, let's see, uh, please, keep being patient. Um, last week, Harvard was in some hot water when they didn't like immediately denounce a pro-Palestinian group um, for their statement on campus. Uh, you made a point on the Chicago principles. What do you think about uh, academic universities making statements on really salient issues or denouncing? Such a great question. You're going to get me in hot water. Just <laughs> um, what an untouchable issue. Um, so in my class, we discussed Israel-Palestine. And I had it on the schedule um, a while ago, and um, uh, I said, "Hey, let's let's move it up because everything's gone on." And um, you know, I think it feels to a lot of pro-Israel students like having that conversation. And it's it's like you're both siding an issue, an instance of how you interpret terrorism, right? Like how how do you both sides that, right? Um, and the Palestinian students are not invited. Don't want to come, right? Nobody wants to talk, and people want to demonstrate. Nobody wants to talk. The uh, and then these campuses, they the, there's a lot of pressure on the presidents, as you said, to come out with statements, and then they have to craft these statements in which they they sufficiently condemn the act of terrorism, which it was, um, while also trying to still say, but we can have an open conversation about the larger issue. And that not be interpreted as opening the door to anti-Semitism and all the rest, right? It's a very, very hard job there. And so one, one approach is just to say, look, we're gonna have institutional neutrality. We're not gonna take sides, political position. The problem is that these schools are already doing it, right? They did it, they did it in the wake of the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, they did it in the wake of uh, George Floyd, uh, they made statements, they did it in the wake of the Dobbs decision. And so now they can't say, oh, we're going to be neutral. <laughs> so I think what bothers a lot of people is that um, people who would be for institutional neutrality are saying, look, you, you, were un, you were not neutral on all those other things. Why are you being neutral now? Right? Like, just be consistent. Um, so I think, I see, I see this, I'm not answering your question. Um, I, think, I think they're in a very hard situation. Um, I guess what I would just say to schools is be consistent. Because if you're going to do it, you got to, you know, if, you, if, if you're going to mention this group, this tragedy, then you need to mention that tragedy too, right? Um, but the, as to your question about whether or not I think it chills speech on campus, if that's what you're getting at, by institutions taking official positions and presidents sending out emails to everybody, I do think in some cases it does. And I think that's not good. Uh, because what ends up happening is that, and I thought about this with the, the Dobbs decision, I led a class discussion on abortion, it was right before that, but I thought to myself, imagine a student raises his hand and says, why are we debating this? Duke has a position on this, like our values are clear. Like why are we, <laughs> this would be like a fair question, like why, why employ me to have, like, as if this is an open conversation? So I think that's a problem. So I think, you know, students, faculty can take positions, but. I'd, I'd rather not universities take I don't know, does, does Davidson, do you guys get emails from your president saying this is, you're nodding your heads? Okay, all right, so it's going on. A lot of pressure to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that's interesting, sorry, I know we're out most of the time, it's like why we feel the need for this. 
Because I actually think that goes back to a more basic failure that we're not actually talking about it ourselves and seem unable to resolve it. So we're like, please, you resolve it. And please, give them my position. You know? And then I won. Right? But in fact, we've not actually done the work of deliberate democracy. So in some sense, I think that desire stems from a previous failure. Yeah, I was just going to say, so I'm uh, Dr. Bullock, uh, Professor in Political Science, also faculty director of the DCI, or Deliberative Citizenship Initiative. I know there's a lot of DCI fellows in there, but there's also some students who are not, um, and alums. And, and so I just wanted to point out, I sort of uh, you know, hear and agree to some extent with John's mm -hmm. skepticism. Mm -hmm. But I also want to sort of end maybe on a note of hope. Or yeah, sorry, that was a little too many. I didn't know we were going to have all these students. I thought I was going to talk to disgruntled alums. Right. <laughs> so, but but they, they just hope. To note hope. <laughs> that John's, John's program, John's course, really, and the Del Deliberative Citizenship Initiative have both received grants from the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation, yep. as well as several you know, similar programs at colleges elsewhere or across the country. Um, to do exactly this work, to create these spaces, to work with student organizations, with alums, uh, to create these um, opportunities for engagement across difference and to create those trusting communities. That um, So we have, shameless plug, we have an event on Thursday on uh, the challenge for democracy that many in the room are going to be facilitating conversations after we have a panel of faculty members talking about to what extent democracy should promote and defend democracy around the world, right? Like very relevant to the Israel and Gaza situation uh, and Ukraine and elsewhere. So um, you can learn more at deliberativecitizenshop.org. Uh, it's right on the front page. Uh, and then we have other opportunities and love to partner with, with any of you uh, um, and hope that you'll sort of lean into those virtues that, that John is talking about. So if thank I, you. If I didn't emphasize this enough, I, and then, I'm sorry. This, doing this work of, of real company, it's, it is possible, it's going on. And there, in any given school, you can probably find one professor of some club is really doing it, and, and it's an oasis, and, and go to it, and you'll discover you can do this. You really can do this. So, so please, be, be hopeful, be positive. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Dr. Rose, that was excellent. Um, I really enjoyed it, I know that quite a few of you likely did too. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this event was made possible um, through David Tones for Freedom of Thought and Discourse and their generous sponsorship and support. Uh, I'm sure that Kevin or Savannah in the back would be happy to talk with any of you guys about uh, the organization and your interest in that. Um, additionally, if you have any questions about the Free Speech Alliance, which is the group that, that hosted and organized this event, uh, please don't hesitate to come talk to me about that. Uh, or if you're a student and you'd like to join the Free Speech Alliance officially, uh, please come find me after this and we'll certainly make that happen. Uh, the next installment in this Free Speech Speaker Series that we've got uh, will be on November 12th uh, when we welcome Kenny Zhu to Davidson's campus. Uh, he's Davidson class of 2019 and has some really interesting thoughts um, on free speech as a whole. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, so thank you again to Dr. Rose uh, for such an outstanding presentation today. I hope you 